and welcome to another modular podcast interview with Matt Lang. Um, hey Matt, how are you? Hey guys, I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Um, just moved, by the looks of things. I did, I am uh, I'm surrounded by boxes only because I'm waiting for a rug to come, and I can't really like set up the studio until the rug that's cut to be the size of the studio arrives. <laughs> Yeah. So, it's just, I'm, the rest of the house is actually like mostly moved in, but the studio, it's boxes. Yeah. So how we're, we're gonna tie the whole room together? Yeah, it really did. Right? It's so, weird how you can get one thing like that that will just act as the fulcrum, and you can't do anything else until one I bit. Know. Usually, not sound related as well. You know? I know it's so frustrating because it seems like such an inconsequential piece. But yeah. <laughs> you know, I can't put the studio together until it's on the ground. Yeah. Here we are. <laughs> um, and Greg, how's it going? Not too bad, Ben. What have you been up to? Uh, Akemi's Castle. <laughs> I really enjoyed yeah. Akemi's Castle. I think I've fallen in love with this module. Um, it's been used in almost everything I've been doing over the last couple of weeks. It's really awesome. good. Basses, drums, everything? Everything. It's so good for percussive stuff as well. I've been using it a lot for that lately. Yeah, nice. And uh, Matthew, how's it going? Yeah, good, thanks. Yeah, I just um, I just acquired another surge panel. I've uh, got an Edelweiss uh, Mark One. Um, yeah, that's doubled. The Octo Tracks got some uh, Octo Tracks got some nice cheeks. Yeah, it got some side cheeks off uh, off Neil Baldwin, which is uh, the great. Made it a lot more kind of usable, just being able to have it at that kind of angle. Um, but yeah, I just got to wait to because uh, the power supply is different on this new surge panel. So just waiting for a, a couple of components so I can convert it, and then yeah, surge panel number two. Look out! That's number three coming. Uh, well, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I like it's going to be the magic one, I think, and then no more. I don't want any more. Yeah, I like you didn't say yeah. no straight away. You're going to get another one. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we've got uh, Matt Lang here to talk about new release uh, patchwork. Uh, yep. Pull an image up for anyone. Uh, we'll chat. Well, general music and modular stuff. Um, some specific questions about specific tracks. Um, there's some serious hints to what's going on in the track names in a few cases. Um, so yeah, um, I kick the first track. Kick off with. A, the first thing I heard was the track Bazimulus Free. Yep. Um, so I take it, well, I think I can hear it, and I think Greg's got a really good ear. I think he knows exactly what it is, but um, how many of the sort of drum sounds and things are the Bazimulus module? Uh, almost all of them. Right, wow. Everything, I mean, some of the claps, uh, the claps are like live recorded, you know, kind of yeah. squished things. But... Um, Sorry, that's my cat. Um, <laughs> she's like, sorry. Get out there. Like, you know, there's like this, there's an access virus on the ground, and it's in like a soft case, so every time she walks by it, she just wants to like crawl on top and start digging. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, I think it's called Basimilis 3 because it was the third attempt at making a track mostly out of just the Basimilis. And um, so pretty much all the percussion, the bass... Um, almost everything except um, some of like the auxiliary percussion, like the claps and stuff like that, and the melody that was actually the loquela. Oh, cool. Yeah, and, uh, and that was kind of like an experiment in trying to make the loquela be pretty. Yeah, a little more tame. Because that can be such a, a really like angry and mean sounding oscillator, which I love about it. But trying to tame it and actually be melodic with it. Um, I don't think that's really ever done with it too often. So. It's definitely my favorite oscillator at the moment, I think. Just really like it. So wide range. It's unbelievable. And um, I just got the new uh, the new Basimilis 2, the alternate, and it's it blew me away because now you have CV control over um, switching between uh, low, mid, and high register as well as like uh, oscillator modes and everything like that. It's really... It's really neat. You can do like the coolest like IDM glitch percussion just by feeding you know random gates into all the switches. It's really amazing how quick you get cool stuff out of it. 
Yeah, I've seen the. I think one of the main things it's got the mode with the envelope to pitch as well. The envelope, yeah. So you yeah. St- straight into kicks and toms and that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, because that was kind of like uh, one of my biggest gripes about the original was that you like the kicks weren't punchy enough. So mm-hmm. I was always just sending an envelope out of maths right into the symbols to do it. And now just because I can, I'm just still doing that into the envelope mode. Just to do it more, you know? but um, yeah, it's it's really great. And also, the other great thing about it too is um, whenever you'd uh, send CV into the old one, the knobs actually became attenuators, and now they're offsets. Which for me, I much prefer in a drum module. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a bit of a um, not to knock the old module at all, but it's a bit of a personal bugbear that. If you set like a, a dry wet at fifty fifty on a knob, and you just want a CV to just go either side of that, and it you plug it in and it's back at zero again. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm really all for them staying as just offsets. And if you need attenuation, use another module. Yeah, yeah, that's that's totally how I see it too. Especially like with percussion, you know, you want to be really surgical with that. So um, yeah, everything Stephen did is just great. I mean, it's a really it's a really fantastic module, and it's smaller, which is great too. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, what was the process in that? People can go and listen to the track, but there's some sounds that I think are more obviously the basimilus from people that have used it, and then other sounds that we certainly weren't sure what they were <laughs> from it as well, which is cool that it's actually most of those. So do you tend to start with a kick? Are you sampling? I think in the case of this one, this one started with a kick. Uh, but, I mean, it could be, and really that's just because the Basimilis by nature is a percussion module. Mm. But, I mean, for me, I could start with anything. I mean, a lot of times, especially, like, this, the whole kind of concept of certainly the first five tracks of Patchwork are each track, in a way, is almost a study of an individual module. So that's why, you know, pretty much uh, out of those first five tracks, they all reference the module that they were all learning, more or less. Mm. And, uh, or just trying to, you know, push. <laughs> more tests. Uh, <laughs> so with the Simulus, because it was, you know, that's a really a percussion-centric module, yeah, it was definitely, um, it started certainly with a beat or something like that. And I think really the way I did it, um, I mean, I did it a while ago, so I think I'm a little fuzzy on the details, but... Um, basically, you know, just making a bunch of hits and just recording it straight to Pro Tools and um, kind of just chopping it up. And so it's not like it's running live throughout the track or anything like that. It's like, here's the kick, here's the hat, here's, you know, his percussion, and then I'm just sequencing it in Pro Tools just for really the, uh, the accuracy of that. And the I think that's it. what myself and Ben were hearing because it's um, recorded as single hits and it's chopped up. I think yeah. whatever, I, I said it to Ben, I think it's probably the most non basimilis basimilis track I've ever heard. <laughs> not that constant modulation with a running basimilis. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm guilty yeah. of that. Transition. Like it. <laughs> nice, nice. I like, you, you hear people, and, and I'm really guilty of it as well, you get one module that you want to focus on, and it's just that thing that you did at that moment. Loads of modulation, all free running, just yeah. going away, um, and it's clear that this is more produced, and um, so are you using any? Is, are these all single hits into a sampler, or just do you? Uh, you know, not a sampler. I just recorded it straight into Pro Tools, just right after the grid. Okay. Right. And just move things around as audio. You know, I mean, probably uh, like hi hats and stuff like that. You know, they're probably like two bar loops or something like that, or realistically, probably a four bar loop that you know. I've, I doubled and, you know, chopped it up, handed left and right so it could be really wide. Um, and then that's where, you know, the natural modulation of the similis really actually comes in handy because I don't even have to do anything. I can just split them left and right and they're, like, really nice and wide and stereo. Yeah. So that was, um, that's kind of where you see more of the natural, natural, you know, modulation of that module. So what's the interface then? Are you, do you take... Well, with this, if you line up basimilus sounds, you didn't have 12 basimiluses to play with or whatever, but uh, yeah. are you triggering out of Pro Tools as well? Are you interfacing between the two or just capturing audio? You know, um, that varies. Sometimes, you know, I'm just jamming out. Like, you know, I might just have the modular clocking itself, um, and then I might 
sometimes I'll send a clock out of Pro Tools once I'm like further along into like a project or something like that. But for the most part, usually the idea comes just um, using like yarns as my clock, and then you know just sending out to Renee or Pressure Points or any other sequencer just to kind of get the idea across, and um, then I'll record it, and then it's just straight audio and just onto the grid, chop it up. Yeah. Yeah. So those those first five tracks, if it's not modular, is there some soft synths involved? Is there some other hardware? Uh, yeah, no soft synth. I mean, um, Contact is really the only soft synth I use a lot. Well, Contact and Reactor, and I don't really, I mean, Contact I use just as a sampler. I just, like, for a lot of basses, what I love doing is, um, like, making, like, drum and bass style Reese's, and, I mean, the modular is so great for that, especially with, like, you know, stuff like the DPO does it really well, the Burt's Donut does it really well. Um, even, like, some of the stuff in braids, like the, uh, the sinusoidal comb filter thing. Yeah. Uh, like when you get some detuning and you get it right around like 11 o'clock, it's that really nice, it's still a lot of sub, but you have a lot of nice additive harmonics in there. Um, but a lot of it, so I'll like, for bass stuff like that, because I just like the sound of um, basically like sample rate style pitch shifting, which is really like that classic sampler thing. Um, I'll make a Reese, you know, on the modular, and that might go through a distortion box or, you know, something like that. I have a Fractal Audio Axe Effects too, which is actually a, it's a guitar processor. Yeah, like guitar, yeah, guitar uh, rack yeah. unit. And um, I use that actually a lot as a processor for the modular. So when making a bass sound, I might, it might start on the modular, then get thrown through that, and then that gets recorded into Pro Tools. And then I'll, you know, I might just record like a C for, 12 bars or something like that, just so I have a really long, you know, moving note. And then that'll get thrown into contact, and then from there, you know, I might go through it and do the notes that way, because then I can have that kind of sound. Um, and then Reactor, I use really just as, like, a granular processor, um, just for making pads and ambiences, and sometimes, like, little clicky things, but it's never a proper synth. It's always a processor of pre-recorded sounds. And those are really my two. Yeah. Have you checked out, um, thinking of granular, have you tried clouds or like the grain de folly or phone? I have clouds. Um, and yeah, clouds definitely gets used a lot. Uh, I tried the grain de folly. Didn't like it as much. Um, Nebula, I'm waiting for the new version of it. Yeah, there's a new one coming. Um, yeah. Because the granular in the old one, um, it just isn't, it doesn't do it for me. And clouds is really great at being clouds. Yeah. But, you know, and for that thing, it's amazing, and I, I love it. I use it a lot. But when I want, like, really clicky, kind of yeah. really digital granular, there's really nothing in modular land that really does that well. Mm. And, uh, and I suppose, sorry? Yeah, I was just going to say, I found the grain of folly card is less spacious and more clicky, but in a yeah. more kind of restricted way. Mm -hmm. Like clouds, it's got a very specific, yeah. I would only go to it for certain things, and it does what it does well, so does cloud, but they're very different. Yeah. yeah. And I still find, like, for the reactor style granular, which is, like, how I got into granular, nothing does it as well as reactor still. Unless you get into like Kina system kind of stuff, and that's a whole you know, different world. But um, but for like clicky granular, Reactor is still my main tool for that, just because of I've also used it for like twelve years, so I know it really well. Yeah, so. I think a lot of that's just got to come down to processing and the amount of power stuff needs. And yeah, yeah. we were talking about the Strymon just to drift off topic. The, Strymon module that's coming and looking at the big sky and saying why aren't they making a reverb? But I think the yeah. big sky pulls about 500 milliamps of power, yeah. which is like over a third of a normal dot for case power supply. Um, so then it's fair. Look at a blue sky, and even that pulls 300. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's fairly obvious they can't port those processors into a module because it just isn't going to work. Yeah, it's going to cripple. cripple. I was having a conversation with um, someone over at Eventide not too long ago because they uh, 
this is about like getting granular into, or like my kind of the kind of granular I want into, you know, your rep. And he was actually saying the reason why it hasn't happened is because it's so good on surfaces like an iPad. Because just having this big visual screen that you can multi-touch and everything like that, from just a pure user standpoint, it's much more appealing to be able to do that than it is to, I mean, try to fit it all into a little module this big, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you seen the uh, one or three sampler for your ORAC, thinking about being able to see the waveform? It looks amazing, doesn't it? That looks really yeah. incredible. I'm just trying to pull a picture up or a video that I can just sort of pause and grab a screen grab from. Yeah, I mean, it's a big module, isn't it? But it's like, I think they've got the size right through the display, etc. It just looks it looks amazing. Is it the, uh, the new Rossum one? No. Right. Is, it, um, is it orthogonal devices? Yeah, orthogonal yeah. devices. Mm -hmm. they, they make the sequencer, they really kind of... Um, I don't know how to describe it. It's like a big grey and red and blue switches on it. It's yeah. got like a sort of retro yeah. kind of LED. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. wow. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's amazing. That video is really cool, actually. And huh. they're scrubbing, you know, zooming in and out of the audio, scrubbing back and forth. Um, it's a preview on Vimeo at the minute. Um, yeah, it's a prototype, isn't it? It's not, yeah. But that's the sequencer to the left of it. Right, right. Very cool. I know Colin Benders makes use of that sequencer, yeah. and um, Richard Devine said when we were speaking to him that if that was a little smaller, just because so space restricted for taking a gig in case, um, yeah. that would be the sequencer he'd have. Mm. Um, so I think they're they're packing this stuff pretty tight. Um, but yeah, yeah, the Rossum one as well with audio rate phase modulation and. CV over windowing in sample playback, and mm. that would be the one. Yeah, it looks, I'm very excited about what those guys are doing. Very good. It could be a year away still. That's the only bad bit, I guess. Yeah. Because um, it was just an announcement of an idea, not mm -hmm. a prototype yet. So, um, but Dave was great. Me and Matthew met Dave at Superbooth um, mm. and got some video of him chatting and. Yeah. And obviously his history as well just completely backs everything up. Oh, uh, yeah. Not to him, though, because you could tell he was, like, super enthusiastic to kind mm -hmm. of come back into this kind of market, as it were. Obviously, he started out making modular sense, you know. and um, But, yeah, you could just tell he's got this new enthusiasm for it and really enjoyed the whole sort of scene. It was really good to hang out, hang out with him briefly. Uh, I got to – I met him at NAMM in January. Right. And uh, and the Morpheus is just yeah, like yeah. I mean, I've basically been one of the things that got me into Eurorack actually initially was just trying to rebuild a Z-plane filter just by you know <laughs> Frankensteining it together. <laughs> yeah. And so now that it's actually coming, that to me is like that's my holy grail of filters right there. So, yeah, since it's out, it's like there's my money. I want it. Uh, I like. I already know what's getting pulled out of the rack to make space for it. Like. It's, <laughs> They're not that far away, are they? The Morpheus, the Control Forge, and Satellite. I think they're fairly close. I would think. Um, they said spring originally, and you know we're in summer now, so it can't be too far off. Yeah. I mean, well, you got the um, evolution filter out quickly yeah. um, from announcing it, so hopefully they'll be quick. There's a few instances of things being announced and them not being, so hopefully this won't be that. Um, he stayed seriously anymore, did he? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, we modular. It's a different world for that sort of thing. Um, thinking of each track being um, a study of a certain module, mm -hmm. um, with Tempe disarming, yeah. that then literally every rhythm, every clock source? Um, not every. I mean, that was... I mean, it's actually... Um, Hertz don't it actually that was much more tempi specific actually. Okay. Um, a lot of like the rhythms in that were uh, you know polyrhythms I had going in tempi, but um, but tempi disarming I was also I did them those two tracks pretty much right next to each other. It was right after I got the tempi, and so I was using it just a ton, just really as a clock source and a subdivider for anything, 
and it was just such a prominent part of that track that I needed a track title. I'm like, I'm going to name you. You deserve a name. So yeah. it was more like a tribute, you know, as opposed to um, really using it to its full potential. Yeah. Does it, it – I mean, this is something me and Matthew talk about a lot, and we're quite into the idea of gear informing what you do and taking you down a certain path mm. beyond an initial idea. Is there an element of that or – Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah. um, that's what I love so much about, you know, the whole Eurorack side of it is that um, it really is the ghost of the machine where you get ideas out of it that you never would have ever thought of ever. Mm. Um, it's like it's, it's all happy accidents all the time, you know, and even when you try to do exactly, you know, like a really program-specific, like, utility almost in a way, you get something that's better that you wouldn't have thought of. Yeah. So... It's, it's nearly, it is weird, that, isn't it? It nearly is always better, I find. It's not yeah. not heading yet, oh, like, this has got too complicated and weird. It's nearly like, it's always that, oh, wow, never thought of this, and it's great. You know? And it's and it could only be something you did with, like, five patch cables. It could yeah. be the most simple yeah. little patch. Yeah, and yeah. It's always, every time. So, yeah, I mean, of course it influences what you do. How could it not, you know? Mm. And how could you not let it? Yeah. yeah. Well, it's hit the nail on the head for me when people ask why modular, because um, there's clearly a lot of people that aren't into it for various reasons. A lot of people that are probably on the fence and curious. Um, it's always that over the idea of digital or analog or does this sound better, are the filters better, or any of that sort of general jargon and rubbish that people ask all the time. Which I've been guilty of as well. It's it's that format. It's happy accidents and tactile. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of that attitude, um, a lot of it comes from the fear of the investment of getting into it, because yeah, it makes sense. You know, it, it's expensive, and especially in this day and age where the majority of music is produced on a laptop, um, without really any hardware. Why why should someone invest? essentially five times the cost of their laptop just to have, you know, a synth that can theoretically in their mind do less than, you know, their yeah. plug-in. Yeah. And, and they don't understand the concept, or it's because, you know, they haven't touched it yet. You know, they haven't used it. They don't have, they don't understand the concept of how it actually changes the music you write. Yeah. 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 For the better, I mean, it's not just about the sound. Yeah, the sound's great. Like, there's no denying that. But... It's the tactile nature of it. It is the the way it changes you as a musician. It's like why play a piano over a guitar? Because you're going to play differently on the piano. Even if you're playing the same melody. Yeah, I mean that's I think that's a perfect analogy. That if like you know in a real world instruments as it were, yeah, you know, why would you walk over to a guitar over a piano? Because you 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 will get a different, a completely different experience. Yeah. Like, yeah, but I, I don't, totally get what you're sort of saying. If you're almost you know you're a you're a kid, you're walking into a music shop and go, well, look, why not spend four times the amount of your laptop and theoretically get far less? It's a big sort of uh, hard sell, isn't it, really, to people? But it's not, you can't really see it in terms of less. It's just a completely different experience. No, you won't be able to put 64 tracks together immediately from that one device, but it will just take you in a completely different direction. Well, you yeah. see those comments, don't you? You could do it all on a laptop. Yeah, all this in your DAW. It's not so much about the destination as it is the journey. Yeah, that's what people completely. It's all about the journey. Well, I don't think you'd get. Never mind the personal journey. I don't think you'd get to the same end result either. Yeah, because like I said, all those happy accidents, be there something sonically or a certain timbre change, or melody or rhythm or the way things overlap with some sort of polyphonic thing going on. I don't think I'd get to the same destination anyway, yeah. if, even if the journey, the journey itself is great, but it's definitely... You're having fun doing it, or what's the point? Mm. That too. Well, I mean, everyone talks about this who gets into it, is, you know, and it's been said a thousand times, but it's worth saying again, is that, that I, you either love it or hate it for this reason, that the fact that every time you turn it off and then back on again... Yeah. You're going you know, to something different. Now, to some people, that's super scary, and to some people, that's the joy of it and why you get into it. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, Definitely. Um, well, you've mentioned. I'll, I'll, I'll jump back and forth as things come up. But um, you mentioned the track hurts, don't it? Obviously, hit that hurts, don't it? From Harvest Man. Yeah. There's some really gnarly sort of cross modulation FM in there that, for those that have tried the module, can maybe pick out a little easier. Um, is it just that sort of one gnarlier sound, or when playing with that, have you sort of tamed it in the same way as the Laquelic? Um, no, like the main, that like big swell, distorted synth. Yeah. The thing that really is painful. Um, that was just, you know, like a really, really gnarly, kind of Reese you know, sawtooth cross-modulated thing. And, but it was also getting distorted through the axe effects, going through like uh, some kind of guitar amp. So it, it took the already nastiness of, you know, the donut and just amplified it that much more. Right. And, but even like the kick drums in that track were made on the donut, the hi-hats, um, I think even a snare was. Like, I mean, it's, the bass certainly was, of course. Uh, it was... That one is actually almost entirely Hertz Donut, except for a finger snap. Right. <laughs> Literally. Yeah. And, like, some of the percussion, I actually think, came out of um, Elements, maybe. It's either Elements or uh, or even the Basenglas. Yeah. No. That's really impressive if that much of it is from the Donut. I certainly would have, wouldn't have picked it out and I've, I've played with the Donut quite a bit. Yeah, that's that was kind of, you know, the whole, like, purpose, in a way, is, like, how... How far can I take this one little module? You know. So when, obviously for, for percussion, that means VCAs, filters, envelopes. Mm -hmm. Have you sort of got a like a set of utilities that when you think I'm going to get everything out of this, have you got a certain few modules that you feel really help you get to where you want to go with things, or is that always different? Uh, yeah. I mean, maths. I mean, certainly for any kind of envelope. Uh, especially percussion, maths. It's, I mean, I use maths for like everything. That is easily the most used module. Um, and then I have this uh, this L1 QVCA mixer. It's like a Schwemann clone. Yeah, and it's on the front of the cover, in it for the release, um, just off to the right, I think. Oh yeah, it's right there. And yeah, for percussion, I love that thing. It's really, really snappy. So, um, I mean, yeah, maths and that QVCA. Uh, they're really, they get used all the time. So for, with, with maths, I mean, it, it's known as a sort of, you've got to have a maths, everybody needs to have one super utility. Yeah. And we, we spoke about in the sort of second monthly show that we do, every month we do a show that's topic based, yeah. with guests or not in a couple of cases, and then we've got these interviews as well. Um, we've talked about envelopes, and I think it's, it's the shape and getting it super exponential more yeah. is the time. Is, have you found that when making drums or? Oh, I mean, yeah, it's my favorite kick drum maker too. I mean, just like a hard, uh, really hard exponential curve out of maths into the exponential input on the DPO, and it's like the best kick drum I've ever heard in my life. Yeah. Like, just the snappiest and hardest hitting thing. Um, well, so, it's it's having that instant drop from a really high pitch in it, because then you don't have to have a sort of softer pitch roll off. Yeah. Right. With like a noise attack on the front or something else mixed you don't in. Need anything. It's all pitch. Yeah, if you can get that, and the WMD multi mode will do that really well. Mm -hmm. um, me and Matthew love, uh, me and Greg love that envelope. Yeah. I, I don't know how it compares to maths, which one goes most exponential, as it were, but. They certainly get close to each other. I have both, so oh, yeah, I'd say they're pretty close. But it's always that. So I'll have to check it out. Yeah, it's one of those uh, full ADSR with the mm -hmm. expander, CV over everything. You can have clocked modulation where each stage will just advance to the next with a clock. That's my favorite thing about it. It's, that's so good. And so yeah. it's wearing gates where it just. It takes four gates to step through. Mm -hmm. So when you fire in a gate, it goes to um, your decay. You fire in another one, it will uh, sustain. You fire in another one, and you get into your release. So yeah. it takes four gates just to step through it. 
which is really useful. Yeah, and you get end of outputs as well for all the stages. Um, inverted output and not to eight volt out, bipolar out. So it's just super useful thing. Um, so yeah, it's worth checking out. Um, so that is the QVCA. Well, QVCA MX. Is that track hinting at the L1 VCA as well, or is that something else? Just a little bit. Um, yep, that one's definitely that one. <laughs> and the, uh, that one had a lot of the Basimilis in it also. Um, and then random things just like noise. I, like at the time, I think the only thing I had when I did that track that was just like a pure no or that could be just pure noise was out of braids. So I ended up um, just using like braids noise and throwing that, that through um, a high pass filter of some kind. It might have been if I had a bluster or something like that. Throwing that then into the, you know, the QB for, yeah, the L1 QBCA. And then, um, but to make it grainy and more shakery, then that went into clouds. And then clouds was, you know, chopping it up. So, um, and giving it like a shakery kind of granular texture. So, um, and then, you know, it was totally out of time at that point. So I just recorded a bunch of them and then just, edited it all in Pro Tools to do that kind of thing. But the the kind of sinusoidal melody, that is actually the uh, 4MS Spectrum Multiband. Oh. Um, yeah, it was just that. Just, you know, resonance cranked all the way up. And it was just, uh, I think I was feeding it uh, just like a random note sequence, or not even note sequence, just a random... Um, Morph sequence uh, coming out of Lava Bug just at, at like uh, I think 16th notes or something like that. I just recorded I don't know a minute and a half of it and just chose out the little bits that I liked. Oh, that's a nice little part of the melody here and that's here and I just then hacked it together again in the audio. Yeah. So did you get into creating sort of custom scales on that or just? No. Um, to be honest, I have a really hard time with that module. Um, I really want to like it more than I do. But getting it to behave musically or melodically is a lot more difficult than um, it's great for percussion and like you know being blippy and weird or spectrally. Yeah. But, uh, but I've had a really hard time to get it to behave the way I want it to when I want to be purely melodic with it. Yeah, the thing the thing I found most helpful with it was setting up a couple of user scales, a sort of major and minor. And I think a major and a minor pentatonic as well. And then when you're morphing, I always know, because you can use the fine tunes on the on the top left and right for the odd and even bands. As long as I've got a major, I can adjust the tuning to get any major key and the same for minor and vice versa. Okay. But it, it, it took a while, I'll be honest, it, it's not quick. But no. that really helped that then when you're morphing, as long as you get the frequency nudge to the root of whatever you're doing, which might take a you know a minute with a tuner or something, or just listening by ear, but once you've done it, that was really worth the investment for getting, like I said, especially throwing random at it, because it meant I could always be within a key. Sure. Yeah, of course. Because um, yeah. there's some really cool stuff when you listen to it on its own, like I said, odd blippy stuff, and there's lots of like... I, I love it sonically, it's fantastic. Yeah, mm -hmm. all the sort of Hungarian gypsy scales and flamencos. There's loads of cool stuff, but it can be really hard to rein in to yeah. to something else. Definitely, um, that takes to audio rate modulation really well. That yeah, it definitely does. It's really you get some really interesting textures out of it, for sure. Um, yeah, you mentioned um, elements as percussion as well. Yep. Um, I, we were questioning about that track um, elementally as well, and and I think there's a sound. Again, we're saying this from free users that are super modular geeks that listen to this stuff all mm. the time. But again, there's a sound in there that's more obviously elements. Yep. What we think. Um, how much of that is elements? Is that the more obvious sound? Sort of I think actually that track is almost entirely elements. Wow! Uh, like yeah. the Even the chord stabs, everything. Um, that is, yeah. That track was that was really a real study in that track. I think everything from the percussion down to the melodic stuff. I think it was actually almost a hundred percent. Wow! Because there is only 
one sound, it's sort of like, oh, I can hear elements. Yeah, and kind of a power plus pluck kind of sound. Oh, yeah, 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 sure. There's, I mean, we get, again, it's people that are really listening to it all the time that their ears prick up for this stuff, but elements has got a specific sound, I think, that you hear a lot of. Yeah. Um, mainly because it's so different to other sound options for the former. Mm -hmm. uh, are you doing much processing with elements then? Or mainly sound generation on its own? Um, in that one, it was mostly... Uh, that was mostly just uh, using that as a source. You know, I wasn't sending anything through it at the time. And uh, it's funny, I only had it for about two months. Uh, just it was like it was a gift for my ex-girlfriend, and after we split, I was like, I have to get rid of this thing. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, um, so after like right after I finished that track, like I sold it, and it's gone just to be out of my life, you know. And uh, I replaced it with uh, with rocks. So <laughs> I can't really go back to it now. But life. Maybe try rings as a similar. Yeah. yeah, it's fun. It's it's good. I like it. You can do. You can be a lot weirder with it than you could with elements. Yeah, I think the mode with the sort of synth effects, string overtones, is what just lets you get that bit weirder. I I use that all the time. It's yeah. really really nice. So what sort of, do you use much in the way of an input to rings? Because I think, and I was super guilty of it for a while. I was lucky to test it, um, working with Olivier doing videos and things. Mm -hmm. um, occasionally testing, and straight away I plug the Vault Proactive sequence in, and because it everything's normal, there's an internal burst generator, you get yeah. sound straight away. I was super guilty of just not playing with the input enough, and then it wasn't until I did that a while after having it mm -hmm. that you realised that because every when it came out, everyone sort of said, "Is it just the right hand side of elements?" As yeah. almost as if the left hand side's irrelevant, but having uh, both amplitude, tonal modulation, various noise sources. I think you need all that to really get a lot out of it. You do. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I do a lot of both. Um, what's great about it is, you know, it, because it has all the internal options, it's great um, as far as uh, simplicity goes when you have a lot of other things going on in your patch. But... Um, when I use it more as like a very for a specific purpose, or I'm just using it to try to kind of create one track or one sound for a track, then I can you know use everything in the rig just to create that one thing. And when that's the case, then um, then I'll be firing a lot more into like the input and you know pushing it more. Um, just you know, I guess using it more to its like fuller potential. Yeah. Yeah. Do you run things back once things hit the computer? Is that sort of it? Are, are things coming back out quite a yeah. lot? Yeah, things come out. Yeah, um, in and out really all the time. Um, whatever you know, whatever makes the most sense, whatever sounds good. Um, like I run stuff out of the computer all the time just to like run it through like a even tide and you know or that axe effects thing. So there's a lot of you know piping back and forth that happens. Yeah, as soon as you mentioned axe effects, um, any reamping. That I tend to do with amps. I tend to do afterwards. Uh, yeah. it's of a different mindset for me. That that type of processing of sometimes it's part of it and part of the jamming and that informs things straight away. But especially for running things through a guitar amp, um, yeah. mainly because I don't have space to have it all set up. I think, but it's always a right. Let's play about with whichever amp and, and mic up a cab. Um, the eye stuff back through a pod or any of that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I'm in the same boat. Um, like, yeah, it's great to just jam out and record, but um, now I find a lot of times is what I'll do is um, basically I'll just I'll record it direct, but I'll monitor through the axe effect. So that way, you know, as I'm playing, I hear it entirely, but I record it and I just have the DI signal, so then I can go and I can fix all the timing or, you know, do whatever I want to it, and then... I could then reamp that sound through, you know, four different sounds at the same time and make this really, you know, big thick wall of sound kind of thing. And you can't really do that, you know, if you just recorded it straight in. No. Do you um do you do much sort of sub other than just maybe layering to create single hits and loops? Do you do much in terms of mixing down parts on the modular? 
and sort of making that decision there and then? Um, not too often. Um, not aside from like when I'm just you know jamming out. Yeah. But when it comes to you know the composition side, I try to keep things as separate as possible, um, unless it's you know a really important part of that sound, then they're together. But, yeah. um, typically, I try to I want to have as much freedom for the mix and stage as possible. Yeah. Which is also why everything ends up sounding you know pretty clinical when it comes out. Yeah. Well, it's certainly the way to get that sound yeah. and why the release sounds very different to modular videos or yeah. general bits of yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's much more produced than just, you know, hitting record for sure. Yeah. 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 So is that do you feel there's anything missing? Because that's a sort of big topic, certainly from Nam and Superbooth and well, not Music Messer because no one went because everyone was at Superbooth. But <laughs> certainly um Loads of sort of output style mixers announced. WMD, Top of Brillo, Qubit. Yeah. I think Harvest Man's working on one, someone said the other day. I don't know if I'm spreading rumours there because I don't know if that's announced. That yeah. wouldn't surprise me. But um, I think you know, loads of people have said they're working on it. Is that something you'd sort of welcome or not that interested because you want the flexibility for what you're um, using? For me, it's not a focus because the modular for me it's mostly a studio tool. Um, for those doing a lot more with live performance, I'm sure they would love it, you know? It's the same thing why like the really complex sequencers don't really for me they just take up a lot of space in my case. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I totally like when I go, you know, like they do like the modular on the spot thing here here in LA and you know I go to those periodically and I see when people are doing this purely performance stuff with it, yeah, you want, you know, you want a really cool mixer, you want really complex sequencers that can do a whole lot as opposed to having to have, you know, four Renees, then your pace is gone. So, like, I totally understand why. Um, for me, just the way I work, I get a lot more value out of getting, you know, more oscillators and filters than, you know, a big crazy mixer or something like that. Yeah. Well, I think it, they're always going to be huge, and I don't think they're ever going to quite well, then it's like everything. They're not going to make. No one's going to make one to suit everyone. Um, but EQs, auxiliaries, panning, mute, solo. I don't think any one of those has everything, which is why there'll be probably ten released within a year of each other. Um, yeah. No, I, it makes sense, you know. And I mean, to be honest, most of the things I record out of modular are mono anyway. Yeah. So, and then you know they end up you know, in Pro Tools land where they got spread out to however they want to. It's only really clouds that, I mean, rings is technically stereo, but I use that as mono. It's really only clouds that I actually use as a stereo tool most of the time, I think. I don't think there's enough of an environment to fully support stereo just yet. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's not quite there. Um, for effects and things as well, um, like some effects are mono in and stereo out, which mm -hmm. if you want to go clouds into something else, means you've lost the idea of clouds being stereo anyway. Right. Um, so it's not quite there, I don't think. I think for me though, as well, with the the advent, you know, certainly this year was the, you know, was the performance mixer year. I think mm -hmm. if you, you know, if you are going to attract anyone over to doing that, as opposed to well, why don't I just get a nice, slightly bigger outboard mixer? is the fact that you've got to be able to put as much CV control over nearly every parameter, I think, to sort of tease people in, for me anyway. I think that's what I'd want. I'd just want to be a CV pan, CV, yeah. or, you know. But well, I guess, obviously, that's when you end up in a, a skiff this long with a mixer in it. Yeah. Well, I mean, for £500, you can get a decent Mackie desk with force end, free exactly. value. Yeah, it's bigger, and it's not in the case, but... Not everything has to be in the case, so yes. Yeah, no, if you're not doing all the CV sending into your mixer anyway, what's the point? Mm. Yeah, but you're just taking up real estate at that point that you could fill with something else that would actually kind of be more useful in a way. Or would do? I don't know. I kind of think you know, what's the point of having something that can do a lesser job than yeah having dedicated units to do what they're best at? Mm. Yeah, I can see something, you know, actually get something quite simple, but just as long as all those parameters that are available are CV controllable, you know, i.e. pan, etc. 
even the, the volume levels, why not have those all CVable as well? You know, yeah. just so that you can you can really just again just put a load of different random gates or whatever onto it and just make it do something that a mixer doesn't normally in inverted commas do. Yeah. It actually really frustrates me that most of the Euro mixers don't take C V for volume. Yeah. Yeah. because um, that seems like such an obvious thing. Yeah. Yeah, it is for me. Yeah, it tends to be VCAs that have a mix out, doesn't it? Like the new, the new UVCA from Intelligel, the second yeah. output's a mix. The L1 mod yeah. VCA you've mentioned. Yeah, um, but I use the Tango Quartet a lot also for that kind of thing too. Yeah, yeah. the new mutable blinds and veils, um, those as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's kind of strange. I mean, I get the small ones. I really like the. I bang on about them all the time. The Manhattan Analog CP3 mixer. Yeah. It's, yeah. It clips so well, that Moog circuit. The STG one's great as well. Yeah. Uh, and that's fair enough in 4HP, but generally yeah. the bigger stuff, yeah, there's a lot There's a lot missing in terms of CV mixing stuff. Yeah. It, just, it just seems like a simple ask, doesn't it, as well? You know, CV for volume. So obvious, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I don't really know what the holdup is there. Okay. Well, it ends up you end up using a mixer and two VCAs or more anyway, so you just end up using way more space um, for what could just be, I don't know, a couple of wires and components on a board that pull the two outputs together. It can't be that much. Yeah, really, it's just you know my VCAs become my mixers ultimately. Yeah. 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 Um. As well as clouds, then, for effects, that was something else I wanted to ask. Uh, Things like reverbs and delays, do you tend to use sort of software effects or other hardware, or have you been exploring uh, Yaro for that? All over. Um, Reverb-wise, um, I have an Eventide DSP 4000. Um, it's like the old big rack thing. So that's my favorite. Um, I just love that thing. It's really... It's not, I, just, I love the sound of Eventide, you know? Um, for delays, um, in Eurorack land, I like Echofon a lot, and I just got, well, just got like a couple months ago, um, that analog device's chrono blob, right. and yeah. that thing is really exciting, um, because I, I think like my favorite thing ever with it right now is just, you know, because you have, you know, you have access to the feedback loop, so just sending out, um, you know, sending out the feedback loop into like a pretty much a distorted bandpass filter out of like a bionic luster and then you know patching it back in. And you get these really gnarly like feedback delays. Mm. And uh, and then you know of course once you start modulating you know the cutoff of the bandpass filter or anything. I mean I've I've put the feedback through clouds just to see how that would work in it. Uh, <laughs> not so you know <laughs> not so effective. At least not if you're trying to keep time. But um that thing is really fun. I really, really, really like that one a lot. I think that's got, um, does that have CV over freeze as well? Just a sort of hold. It sure does. Yeah, holding the buffer. Mm -hmm. Sounds, from what I've heard, I don't have both. I've got an Echophone, but I don't have the Chronoglob. It's very different to the freeze on the Echophone. Yeah, yeah. Um, they're really different animals. That's, I mean, they're both great. Have both. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, tying two things together just sprung to mind about stereo and now effects. The audio damage stuff is all stereo. Yeah. Don't I don't know if well any of you've looked too much into that. The new wave shaper shapes, mm -hmm. uh, the delay, their spectre, the sort of spectral freeze. I guess yeah. like the um, what's the electro harmonics pedal that does that? Is that just called freeze? Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. it is. Yeah, because I've seen people modding those EHX pedals so that they can take a game. Oh, yeah, 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 I know what you mean. Just, you know, like a spectral grab, and you just yeah. get a big blur, sort of sheet ice sound. Yeah. Right. So big on the DIY scene, aren't they, to kind of get and mod? Yeah, there's really... There's, I know Ginkgo Simsies, um, Jan, does... Um, I think he's helping people out and sending, like, a little DIY pack with only a few components in. Um, for any pedal, and it, you just come off the um, you come off the switch in the pedal, I think, so it'll work for anything, and you can just get on and off effects pedals. Oh wow, that's good. 
And thinking of that, Synthrotech, I think, do um, do they call it a VAC pack or something that allows you to add CV in to, I think, different knobs on pedals as well. I think it's a, a Vactral that you tie. Um, my DIY electronics is terrible, but um, you just tie it around the pot somehow, I think, and let the Vactral affect the amount of voltage that comes through. All right. So you really can turn the actual on and off switch in and every single parameter to a little... Yeah, potentially amazing, isn't it, <laughs> if, you can, if you can get that. But, yeah, modding loads of old pedals and stuff. You can get some really cool stuff out of it yeah. that way. Um, yeah. I've never heard of that. That's cool. Yeah. Um, so uh, someone asked me the question earlier, so I'll put it to you as well. Uh, you're all right, Reverb? Are you using anything for Reverb or playing around? Uh, I'm not, um, only because uh, I ran out of space. And yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's right now I have like two other you know empty racks that at my old place I didn't have room for them, and uh, now once in this you know the new room here there will be, so uh, unfortunately I'm gonna have to start buying things again. <laughs> are you ready? Are you ready for it to completely take over? Have you embraced it? <laughs> I mean it had it it had I mean because now my main case is you know. 120. It's four rows of 126, mm. and and that you know, I only got that one a year ago, and that was filled up pretty quickly. So after that, I was kind of like, you know what, I I need to slow down, you know, for a minute, and then um, I was gonna I was going on this bus tour with um with Dead Mouse, and so I got one of those um just the CV bus cases from Tony. Yeah. And then last minute, the tour gets canceled like the day before I was about to leave. No. Oh, wow. so, which sucked, but um, when I did end up going to Joel's house, I just filled that up as like a little travel case, and you know, brought it with me to Toronto. But uh, now, since I mean, I don't really like traveling with those things either, just because I get scared, and you know, I want it to all live in the safety of my home. Yeah. So now I have you know the big dark modular case, then that case, and then another like uh, make noise skiff. That um. So I guess I have like three more rows of stuff I can better. Currently empty, but on the right side, they're not set up yet. <laughs> <laughs> I think though that it's a bit like when people go mad for plugins and just star stuff. It, not many people, I guess, possibly a time thing as well. I, I don't have time to do it as much as I'd want, but mm -hmm. the way that you're pulling these sort of studies together, you know, if um, the track elementally, the Zimulus, if everything on, on, you know, more than half of that is just that module, then you're pulling a hell of a lot out of the gear. Yeah. Um, so I guess that's me validate, you know, go buy what you want. <laughs> Fill it up quickly. Um, you're using well, it. Well, that's the thing, man. Like, because, I mean, I find if I, I can't buy five things at once. If I buy, five, like, five things at once, I'm going to, you know, spread my attention too thin across them. Yeah, definitely. So I'm much better, like, get, like, not utility stuff, because whatever. But, you know, like, specialized things, buy that one at a time and just learn it in and out. Because yeah. if I don't do that, then I probably never will, because I'm going to buy something else eventually, and then my attention's going to go to that. Yeah. And, that's, and there's, no, there's no better way as well than going, right, I've got this new module. I'm going to make an entire track with this and really push and find its edges if there are any edges yeah. to find, you know, and just really kind of drill down deep into it. I just, you just get so much pleasure from doing that. It's just so good. Again, again, rather than just kind of if you do have the cash to do it, to go, oh, well, I need to go, I need another one of these, or I need to go get that as well to make this sound. Try and do it with that one module. If you can't, go and get another module. But most of the time, it will just take you in a fantastic direction, you know. Yeah, and that's... And I mean, and some of the modules there are so deep. I mean, I've had Shapeshifter for two years, and I still don't really know how to use it. I think. Yeah, you know? <laughs> like, yeah Shapeshifter, and I love Shapeshifter for exactly that reason. Yeah. That I know it's this kind of like wormhole of kind of possibilities that I'm never going to completely ever understand. You know. And the great thing about that one too is, you know, everyone who has it uses it completely differently. Yeah. So. 
But I mean, and it's funny, like that's, I have a hard time, I think ultimately when modules get that deep, I have a hard time with them because I feel like you need almost like a physics degree to truly understand <laughs> everything about them. And, uh, and then at that point, I'll just move to something else once I have to dive that deeply into it. But that said, you know, the flip side of that coin is when I do spend time with it, then I get these really interesting things that I wouldn't have gotten. But I have to force myself to really, you know, be a student of it. Yeah. I think putting the time in, that's the way that things really integrate in the workflow anyway. It's yeah. like having a, a collection of vintage guitars. If you've played them all enough, you know which one's going to do that specific job the best. Yeah. And it's only through putting that time in that you really know, you know, especially in a situation where you might have to do something to a deadline or a self-imposed restriction. You're not just playing around that evening. Yeah. You really know what you're doing once you've put that time in with the stuff already. Absolutely. Um, you mentioned um, it was something I wanted to ask for other releases of yours. Um, you mentioned having the shapeshifter for two years. Roughly yeah. how long have you been into modular? Uh, pretty recently. I would only two and a half, maybe. Like it's it's a new thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's about the same as me and Greg. Actually, we're not yeah. that far into it. Um, so what what got you into it? Was it friends that had stuff that you tried? Uh, yeah, I mean, I was exposed to it um, about a decade ago, actually. Um, I was working for a BT at the time, and um, Richard Devine came by one day, and him and uh, Josh Kay, they were driving through, going up to, I think, uh, Rhode Island, and in the back of, like, Richard's old Civic, he had just this, like, uh, doper case that was, you know, plastic tied together with, like, the locking plastic ties. <laughs> And uh, and that night he was just putting it all together in BT's living room, and that was kind of the first time um, I ever really got you know I would say I it wasn't on I didn't get to hear it or anything like that um, it was the first time I really got to see one though so that kind of put the idea in my head and then for I want to say you know a good seven years or so more and more people kept telling me you have to get into it. You have to get into it. And then um, it was finally when, like, a old professor of mine from Berkeley. He actually, um, he, uh, Dr. Uh, Richard Boulanger, he's really, he's a huge proponent of C-Sound, and, you know, he helps the Qubit guys get the, uh, God, what's that one called, the granular one, Nebula. Um, he helped them like, get that off the ground, and he's, you know, he's involved in that and everything like that. And he finally was, like, the final, like, straw on the camel's back that I have to do it. So... Fortunately, a friend of mine came over, and he already had, you know, three cases filled up. Brought him over, and 20 minutes later, it's just like, I am so fucked. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you knew it was happening. Yeah, and that was it. Like, right then and there. So I just started with, like, one of those little um, make noise system zeros. And, you know, and it was just like, it was a DPO, a maths. So I had them stick an MMG in there, and I think, like, an Optimix and maybe something else. And uh, I just quickly filled out that case by adding yarns, just like an interface, uh, you know, with a computer, and, uh, like, a Pittsburgh envelope, which I got rid of soon after, and, uh, and braids. And for the first year, that pretty much was it. And then... Then I got some bigger checks suddenly, you know, a year and a half ago, and then it grew very rapidly. Yeah. It's amazing, though, the amount you can do with a small case. Again, that's something... I kind of miss that, in a way. Yeah, I mean, well, look at that, and then I really like just thinking, what am I going to do with this one nine year case? Or I keep pulling this one up because I'm, I'm obsessed with what I might be able to do with it, but haven't had the time to do it yet. Just a 54 HP single case that's got a couple of um, one new tile rolls in it. Yeah. And then going one further, funnily, I've mentioned this before as well, but I'm still excited by the idea. I need to message him and talk about it. Mm -hmm. This is the complete ridiculous end of the spectrum, but the Dofa Beauty case. Yeah. Um, Literally four modules, four HP, four eight HP modules, um, 
Logan at Loggain said, why don't we do a dope for beauty case challenge and see what you can get. But I'm sure we'll get some stuff. And then in not much bigger than that, like, like you said, the system uh, zero from Make Noise and just a couple of other modules. Yeah. What? I mean, it sounds like you're still working that way even, doing these sort of studies of modules with some supporting stuff around it. Yeah, I mean, it depends what I'm doing. Like, uh, when I'm just jamming out, then it's, I'm not doing that. Then it's, you know, everything all yeah. put together. But a lot of the times I use the modular for, like, really specific reasons. So, I mean, I might have this idea already going, and that idea could have come from anywhere. It could have come from a modular. It could have been from a guitar, but um, then I turn to the modular to do one element, you know? Yeah. And, and when that's the case, then, you know, your whole relationship with how you use it changes, because then it's no longer your canvas, it's just another color. Mm. So, I actually, and I really, I like the, you know, the differentiation between the two, because when it just becomes a color, then... Then I can also kind of use, yeah, yes, I can focus on just one module to do one thing, but I can use the entire system all just to make one sound if I really wanted to, as opposed to, you know, I only have this many VCAs and I want to do this many things. Like, I don't have to think about that. I can use everything just for that one bit. Yeah. So, you know, it's just, it's another tool, and I'll, whatever way, it, like, makes sense to use at that moment, that's how I'll do it. Yeah. Um, I'm not a purist by any means. It's like there's no room for that for how I work, you know? Well, I don't think we are either. As much as this is super geek modular talk for peace, for the audience and for us, I'm sure casual music listeners are talking, listening to us talk more than an hour about modular. Uh, yeah. We're all the same um, with it, I think. Um, none of us hate software. None of us hate other gear. We're not completely tunnel vision. I don't think you can be. You can't, because like everything's so good at different things. Yeah. And it, it seems so silly to just limit yourself. Why wouldn't you? You know? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, are there any? I always like looking at negatives and weaknesses, and again, something all of us talk about. Um, but not in a you know, no one's trying to be down on any specific module, but is there anything you feel the format's sort of missing, or that's a weakness, or something you'd like to see? Um, I mean, the thing I always miss the most is just polyphony, but that isn't really uh, natural to the modular. I mean, you can, you can do it, but it, it's, it doesn't make sense to, at least, you know, I just... But that's kind of the one thing I miss, um, in a way, but it forces me to be more creative. Um, I really, really want a really good granular processor that will do more, like, reactor-style granular, or even chemo system, like, really high-tech, blurry or clicky, however you want it to be. Um, right. And the other thing... And I really wanted that audio damn spectre to do this, and then it didn't. Um, just like a, a spectral blurring, not just a freezing, but, you know, a spectral time-shifting FFT-style phase vocoder thing. And that would be really fun to have, you know, where you can, you know, bin shift and whatever you want, and you can kind of do it with clouds, you know, in spectral madness mode, but I'd love to have a module, or a module that just focuses purely on yeah. the style time stretching and pitch shifting. Well, you said the first thing that came to mind, the spectral madness mode in clouds that sort of does the pulse stretch thing. Yeah. Kind of. Kind of. And I want one that really does it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's how clouds started, actually, if I remember right. Yeah, it did. That's right. Yeah, and then develop from there, and then they're all just sort of extras that you get. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not sure that wave of like high-end reverb, the sort of processor heavy stuff, I think a lot of the general tones and processing people want are sort of being filled in with the amount of digital that, I mean, I've, like I said, I've only been into it less than three years, if I remember right. Um, 
but there's certainly more of a welcoming of the digital stuff. It was still a little, it seemed a little bit, even two or three years ago, like digital was a dirty word still. Mm -hmm. uh, but it seems to be all embraced and development coming all the time. Yeah, it's funny. I think actually the majority of my system's digital at this point, which is, <laughs> I, mean, I didn't plan on it. I think I only have one analog oscillator, which is a DPO. Everything else ended up, you know, and I'm like, I'm keeping my eye out for a Schwemann, so DCO2, just to have that, you know? But everything else, it was like, well, I could get, you know, an analog oscillator that's going to do, for the most part, you know, square sine pulse, or I could get this really cool fucked up digital module that's going to do really good <laughs> shit. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think the three of us... Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, anyone, we'd all take digital oscillators over analog if it was one or the other. Yeah. Um, so you've got... Um, do you find that... I don't have both to compare, just personal curiosity. Do the Hertz Donut and the Laquelli step on each other's toes at all? Are they completely different? Oh, no, they're, they're such different animals. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, you can make the donut be pretty traditional if you want it to be. Right. Um, the Loquelic, I mean, really, that's a, that's a crazy study in, like, FM. You know, if anything, the closest thing I can compare it to is uh, some of the FM in the shapeshifter. But, I mean, it's just a different animal entirely. Um, the immediacy I love of it, it's just like you can just get in there straight away and anything that you seem to do and touch with it, it's like, wow, this is great, you know. Yeah. I still need more coaxing, you know, definitely like the shapeshifter, but that is just hands down, hands on, great, straight out of the box. Yeah, it, it's it's just an inspiring module, and it sounds, it sounds like nothing else I have, you know, and that quickly, that's the thing. It just, yeah. So yeah, nice. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, we've covered, I'm sure we could go on for another hour or more. We'll all talk modular all day and all evening. Um, you saw yes. anything else anyone wants to cover? Um, anywhere they want to lead a bit of conversation? Or I think we've covered most of the sort of... Yeah, there we are, haven't we, really? Cool. Yeah, we've covered all the sort of questions we had just from listening. Um, yeah, I mean... Is this the first, or that, I guess this is sort of last thing to round on, is yeah. how much modular has been on other releases prior to this? I know this is the first push as a sort of focus on the modular, but... Um, well, the last album, um, Ephemera, that was actually all sourced from, like, all the... That was mostly sourced on the modular, too. Like, all the club tracks, that was... Um, that was mostly modular. Um... I just, for whatever reason, this one, just thematically, this one took a different direction, you know? But, uh, no, I mean, I've been using it, certainly, in my music for ever since I got into it, you know? Yeah, cool. Yeah. One thing I didn't ask because it came to mind, but when you talked about, you know, using, I don't know, 9U just to make a single snare or anything yeah. like that, and collecting all these bits of audio. Um, mm -hmm. I imagine, you know, it's all said, it's all backed up, everything. Um, for anyone wanting those sounds, have you thought about making a sample pack or something? Uh, like yeah, actually. Um, there is going to be a patchwork sample pack. And cool. it's already, I mean, I finished it a month ago. It's just in the hands of lawyers right now. Yeah. <laughs> it's just the bane of my existence because it takes forever, you know? But, um, but it's all done, like it's all, and it's all the individual hits from every track and all the percussion, some of the bass stuff. Originally, I put the melody, like the unlock material in there too, but I ended up stripping it because it's more. I'd rather people have the percussion and you know the samples as opposed to be able to use a melody and be like, hey, here's our remix. Great. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, it's done. It's uh, it's just waiting to get all sorted with the label and everything like that, so that way it can finally get out there. But, uh, and I'll send it to you guys. It's like, I don't know. There are maybe 
it's like 100 megabytes, I think, roughly. It's, it's pretty decent sized, you know. Well, I thought about buying a um, Volca sample with the idea of sampling my own stuff into that just for some sort of old and having to pitch things up to get more out of the memory and I, I quite yeah. want to yeah. see how that inform again about this the, the, the instrument informing what I'm doing I quite like the idea of having to work in that way and seeing what that offers oh, I think the thing I want to do now I really wish um, Patchwork was pressed to vinyl just because I have ephemera on vinyl and I actually want to <laughs> in a way sample myself off the vinyl just to like you know, and pitch it down or something like that. Yes. Yeah. Um, just to get you know, it's like a new version of the drum hits again. And since every track, you know, for the most part has like a minute long DJ intro, it'll be really easy to do. Mm. Yeah. And the, you know, and that could actually become a sample pack in its own right too if I really wanted it to. So. Well, and, I mean, beyond the Volker, things like the Grandpa from Bastel, Radio Music. Some of the new samplers that are coming. Mm -hmm. uh, Talking about the Picos as well to you, Ben. Recently, those what? The Pico drums are going to do it as well. Yeah, the Erica Sim stuff, even the Phonogene from Make Noise and sort of yes. scattering back through your own beats and. Mm -hmm. uh, I love the idea of I call it sample fodder. You just create yeah. moments just, and feels and textures and just play like something them. else. Yeah. 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 Well. Yeah. We'll watch out for it. Love to check it out when it comes. Yeah, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll send you a link to it, and then I'll let you know when it actually becomes real. Also, um, I just have no idea when that's going to be, unfortunately. Yeah, I like the idea. That plays really well into something um, we want to do. We've discussed the idea of us all having the same. We've been trying to think of what modules we all have, mm -hmm. just restricting ourselves to that. So I don't know six modules that we've all got and all creating a patch, and that being a discussion for another show. Yeah. I like the idea of all being given the same source material and yeah. no instruction other than that. Just You can't use any sound other than this. Process mm -hmm. it, program it, do whatever you want. Yeah. And that being like a constant set of recycling back through itself. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just a good exercise too, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think those limits either – space limits in a small case or thought processes as you've done for I'm going to really rinse this module for as much as I can. Yeah. Uh, it sort of almost forces creativity and I think it's good on those days where you're not maybe feeling as creative. Yeah. I, if I tell myself I'm just going to look at this, whatever mood I'm in or however creative I may be feeling, however you want to label that, it seems to go somewhere quite quickly if, if there's a bit of restriction. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Well, it's the whole thing, you know, like creativity being born out of necessity. And when you're staring, I mean, when you're staring at, you know, rows and rows of, you know, in this case, modules, it's like because you have almost limitless options, what do you do? Mm. You know, but then, like, I only have these three things to work in. You know, it really it forces you. And uh, I do actually miss, it's like that whole thing we are talking about earlier, I kind of miss the simplicity of that in a smaller system, just because now I really have to force myself to not use everything. Yeah. Well, the yeah. time it you, really comes to life for you, Matthew, is when, um, when you go to meets and events, you just take fix you, don't you? Yeah, on just on purpose, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm doing a gig in Toronto late in August, and I'm just taking this small 6U case. And yeah. I really like the planning of exactly how much sort of rack real estate I'm going to need and use. And that's it. That informs the piece. You know, of course, there's always those times, oh, what if I just had that extra? Yeah, but forget it because you haven't got it. You know, so that I can go, you know, it's flight ready. I can take it on this hand luggage. And that's it, you know. And I really, really like those restrictions, and I really enjoy the planning stage of doing it. And then it comes back, you know. And then I've got comes back to the mothership, as it were, with the other stuff. But yeah, yeah. we we spoke about this before, and we about the fact that we've got, kind of got into rather than buying some huge, huge monster case, he's buying sort of. I know again, he's sold more money to do it, but more smaller cases, and looking at those as modules within modular. Right, yeah. Kind of, you know, you know, that you're making these almost like smaller, 
performance uh, setups for your own studio, rather than, you know, like, like you just mentioned, confronting this kind of monolith and going, oh, what do I do, you know? Yeah. It's, I think it's a lot easier to see when they're in these blocks. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Um, well, I'll bring up um, Patchwork again, screen share it. Um, where do you, where's best for people to go get it? Um, any links you want to sort of drop before we finish? Um, no. I mean, that's uh, this is the one, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you're going to find it wherever you look. Obviously, putting it into a search engine is going to pull it up. We'll just put all the links in the description anyway, won't we? Yeah, Perfect. we'll link to all that stuff. Um, so, yeah, check it out. Um, I think people will be surprised. That, and it, it really says a lot, I think, for the format that certain modules are really shining at way more stuff yeah. than seems obvious. I think it's a good advert. It's going to sell some of those modules. Mm-hmm. I hope so. Maybe, yeah, maybe they'll uh, start sending me a lot of them for free, right? <laughs> <laughs> That'll never happen. But uh, I will say, if you take your piston Honda and you set it to be 666, using that as a wave shaper is extra evil. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I notice on the cover, uh, I'll pull it back up again, it's set to 666 on the cover. It really is. Scott always does that as well. He always sets it to 666, and I think he deliberately does that. They're because ha- it's so funny. Like, you know, when uh, when you're scanning through, you know, the wavetable numbers on there, and if, you know, arbitrarily, like 465, 466, 467, they're all you know pretty related to each other. 665 is one thing. 666 is completely different from everything else out there, and then 667, 8, 9, then they get you know more you know. Linear again, but that one number is just. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, highly recommended. And it's funny, like that module, I use that more as an external wave shaper than anything else. I actually don't really use it that often as an oscillator. Right. But but as a wave shaper, man, that's that is so much fun. It sounds great. Yeah, I don't. I don't have one yet. But I use the Geiger counter, which is a similar idea of wave tables that you can process through. Uh, yeah. really- so we're going to have on a future show, Ben. Uh, James Sigger has put up a recent video with a piston on the, which is really good. Yeah, James's videos are fantastic. I think he's done a couple of the Harvest Man ones recently. Oh, yeah. Um, it's worth watching out, anyone that wants to check it out. Yeah, uh, yeah cool. Well, uh, people yeah. for um, Patchwork, uh, check the tracks out. Um, find you on all your usual places. Um, we'll link everything in the description. Um, and yeah, thanks for coming on and talking to us, and um, we look forward to checking out future stuff. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. Right. See everyone there. All right. See you guys.